All right. Well, please open your Bible to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for what you have accomplished through him. We thank you for the hope that we have, the new life that we have. We thank you that you have rescued us from the condemnation that our sin deserves. And you have rescued us from sin's power, which it once had over us. Lord, now by your strength, because of your work, we can live for you, we can honor you, we can please you, we can endure in this world for the glory of your name, all because of you. So Lord, help us to that end. Help us now through your word, Lord, that we would see your instruction, that we would heed it. Lord, that we would be conformed more into the likeness of our Savior as a result of your word working in us through the power of your spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we started looking at this section in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, two weeks ago. When we were gone, I was gone at camp last week, and so Tom taught from 1 Corinthians 10, did a wonderful job encouraging us in regards to the sufficiency of God and making a way of escape in the midst of temptations. And now we're jumping back into this passage that we started looking at, and we're going to keep working our way through it, where Peter is helping believers understand not only how to endure suffering and get through the hardship, the bar is higher than that for Peter. He's actually helping the believer Understand how to thrive in the midst of opponents coming against you, in the midst of persecutions and hardships and suffering for the name of Christ. How do we thrive spiritually while passing through the trials and the sufferings and the fiery ordeals that come for the believer because of their association with and their allegiance to Jesus? These early believers Peter is writing are in the thick of persecution. They're being tried, maligned. They're facing increasing hostility. And what Peter points them to is not how to escape the mistreatment. Not how to just hang on for dear life or simply get by. He's not teaching them how, how do you get the mistreatment to stop Peter's not instructing them on how to get it to stop because the only real way to get it to stop would be to forsake Christ. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, 18. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. See, you want the world to love you, hate Jesus. If you love Jesus, the world will hate you. He goes on to say, John does, or Jesus does in John, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. The world hated Christ. They hate the light. And if you're a believer, you are now in the light. Your life is now being lived for Jesus. And this is an indictment on the world, and you will receive the hostility that they have towards Christ. And so Peter is helping them understand how to endure their suffering, but not simply endure it and get by. He's helping them understand how do you endure this suffering for the name of Christ in holiness, in godliness. He wants them to thrive spiritually in the midst of it. And Peter understands that external threats and hardships are not obstacles to what God is seeking to do in these believers. Do you understand that? Persecutions, hardships, trials are not obstacles to what God is seeking to accomplish in his people. Oftentimes they're the means 
of him accomplishing wonderful things through and in his people. God sanctifies the believer through suffering. He matures the believer through suffering. He grants a refined faith through suffering, which in chapter 1 he says is more precious than gold. These are wonderful gifts from the Lord. It doesn't always feel that way in the midst of the suffering, doesn't it? In fact, oftentimes the temptation in the midst of suffering for righteousness is to want to give up, to want to compromise, to want to throw in the towel. I'm done with this. If this is what coming to Jesus gets me, I'm through. Right? That's the lies that we are faced with even in our own heart, to doubt whether it's truly worth it to follow Jesus, to think something from our old life would be better than what we are experiencing in the new life that we've been given in Christ. We spoke about this last time. Peter knows what it is like to crumble and fail in the midst of the threat of persecution. Do you remember this? He denied Jesus three times. After being told that he would do so and swearing he would never do it, even if he had to die, he wouldn't deny his Savior. And yet, in the midst of the heat of the pressure, he compromised. Now he's grown and he's matured. There's hope for this, hope for us in this. There's comfort for us, encouragement. And tradition would actually tell us that Peter grew to the point to where when facing persecution and opposition, he actually requested to be crucified upside down because he did not count himself worthy of a death in the same manner as his Savior. Peter is someone to listen to on this topic. He, he learned the hard way, and he clearly learned Peter in our passage is really going to narrow in and give to the believer the right tools, really the right thinking, not to just get through the persecution, but to be able to continue to grow in holiness, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of temptation and persecution and rejection that comes to those who are faithful to Christ. And listen, in our culture, in our society, we have had it easy for a long time relative to history. What these early believers were facing, what was coming against them was extremely severe. And this is especially helpful and informative to us because every indication of the direction that our society and our culture is going tells us that hostility towards the believer is only increasing. Do you notice that? Do you feel that? The accusations of hate the accusations of being narrow-minded and the world calling what is good evil and what is evil good, there's an emboldening that we're seeing all the more in our culture. This is timely for us. This is helpful for us because if we think that the ease in which we've been able to navigate our Christian faith without facing persecution is just going to remain the same, we're mistaken. And that's not to to belittle the hardship that I'm sure has come for many of you, families, uh, relationships broken, <laughs> family relationships broken, friendships lost, promotions overlooked, all sorts of hardship. I, I know that you have experienced those things. And yet we need to fortify ourselves in these truths because it seems that that hostility is only increasing so let's read our passage together, and then we'll continue to make our way through here. First Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we'll read through verse 6. Peter says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. 
In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account. They will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The main idea here of what Peter is putting before us is to arm yourselves with the proper tools to endure suffering in holiness. The believer here is called to arm themselves, we are called to arm ourselves with the proper tools to endure suffering in holiness. How do we equip ourselves with the right tools to persevere in holiness when the fiery ordeal comes upon us? How do we not shrink back? And Peter arms us really with two essential tools categorized this way. The first we covered last time, and it's the proper thinking to embrace. And then he shows us the proper motivation to possess. The proper thinking to embrace and the proper motivation to possess. Now, by way of review, first he gives us the proper thinking to embrace. And we see this in verses 1 and 2. The proper thinking is twofold. And they're related. They overlap with one another. They complement one another. They coincide with each other. And we must first embrace the mindset of Christ. And then we also, in conjunction with that, or in relation to that, we also embrace the will of God. Now, first, the mindset of Christ. Verse 1, Peter says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose as Christ. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And Peter begins chapter 4 saying, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh. And we said last time how Peter is referencing back to chapter 3, verse 18, where Jesus died for sins being put to death in the flesh. That is, he died as a man. And here he refers to it as suffering in the flesh. And so, since Jesus suffered this way for righteousness to accomplish God's will to accomplish God's plan, so also should you arm yourself with the same purpose. Be ready, be prepared. Be of the mindset that you are ready to suffer in this life for the sake of righteousness and in accordance with the will of God. Peter says, arm yourselves. This is the idea of getting equipped, and it's for the purpose of persevering in holiness in the midst of suffering. Train yourself, equip yourself with the same purpose as Christ. Be like Christ at the thinking level. Committed to obedience to the Father, committed to the glory of God, regardless of the cost. Willing to be put to death in the flesh. Why? Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. How has the believer who suffers for Christ, the one who has done this well, how have they ceased from sin? Well, we saw how the one transformed by God's grace is no longer enslaved to sin, no longer under sin's bondage, no longer under sin's ultimate power. We've ceased from being slaves to sin. Peter is saying, arm yourself with the same purpose as Christ, align your thinking with Christ, because sin no longer has power over you as it once did. We've ceased from sin in that we ceased being under its enslaving power. We're done with sin in that the chains are gone. You're no longer enslaved to the sin in your life. And as you suffer for Christ and align your thinking with him and persevere in the suffering, it actually strengthens your faith. It confirms the work of God that he has done in you. It boosts your confidence to then persevere all the more in holiness. So faithful perseverance is actually breeding more faithful perseverance. That's God's intention and design for his people. And so arm yourself with the same purpose as Christ because sin no longer has power over you and you love the things that Jesus loves. And what does Jesus love? The glory of the Father. He loves to follow the Father's will. 
That is the mind and the heart of the believer who has been saved by the grace of God through the work of Jesus. That is what we are to have. That is the mindset we are to have. We align our thinking with Jesus' thinking. We hate sin. We love righteousness regardless of the temporal cost. Do you prize holiness more than comfort? More than ease? More than temporal pleasures? Where are you tempted to prize those things more than holiness? Where are you tempted to think that that old manner of enslavement to sin is better? We need to put that thinking to death. We need to set that thinking aside. We need to align our thinking with the Lord Jesus Christ and his thinking. And listen, in his thinking, obedience to the Father is always the best path. Just is. Yeah, but you don't understand what I've experienced. Jesus does. We have a great high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. He knows. This is what we are called to. Well, Peter continues to point us to the thinking we must embrace in verse 2 with the complementing reality that we must embrace thinking that embraces the will of God. In verse 2, he says, So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. And this idea of holiness, of persevering in holiness and growing in holiness is becoming clearer and clearer as Peter makes his way through these verses. Well, we have the mindset of Christ, we imitate his thinking so that we live the rest of this life in the flesh, that's just the rest of this temporal life in this body, we live it no longer under sin's power, no longer under uh, lusts of men, fleshly lusts, but rather we live the rest of the time on this earth in holiness. Do you pray that prayer? Do you think about that intentionally? Lord, you have saved me. You have rescued me from the domain of darkness. You transferred me to the kingdom of your beloved son. Your grace, you have lavished upon me. I have hope. I have Christ. I'm no longer under condemnation. And it's all because of the work of Christ. It's all because of his righteousness that I have been granted through faith. And even that was a gift from you. And in all of this, now he has not only given me his righteousness, but has taken upon himself the wrath and the condemnation and the punishment that my sin rightly deserves. And now, Lord, in light of these things, I have a free pass into heaven and can live any way I want. Or, in light of these things, Lord, whatever time I have left in this life, let it be dominated by an insatiable, insatiable desire to be holy before you and to no longer live in the flesh that I once was enslaved to. That's what Peter is putting before us. That kind of mindset, that kind of attitude, that kind of thinking that's the kind of thinking we are to embrace. That's the kind of thinking we are to have. The rest of this life in the flesh that is in this fallen body, I no longer want to live driven by the lusts of the flesh, of fallen men, but rather for the will of God. Don't live for your old cravings. Don't live like you used to live, but rather pursue and live and walk in holiness. And listen, do this even in the midst of the most fierce opposition that comes against you for that very pursuit of holiness that you experience. Keep pressing on in it. Don't let your foot off the gas or for half of you the accelerator pedal. Keep going. And particularly when you experience suffering because of your love for Jesus and you're tempted to run back to the old ways of life, don't do it. Peter's really going to dig in on that principle because it's no longer who you are in Christ. 
You've had an identity change in Christ. In fact, you should hate that old way of life. There should be a, an indignation against your sin as you walk in repentance. It was only destructive, and it costs your Savior his life. So that's the proper thinking we are to embrace. The believer embraces the mindset of Christ, and the believer pursues the will of God. Well, next, Peter is going to help equip us with the proper motivation to possess. The proper motivation to possess, and we see this in verses 3 through 6, and he starts with instructing us to really have a disdain of our sinful past a disgust or a distaste about the way we once lived. And listen, this is really important for clarity. This is not a disdain against worldly sinners. Okay? We're, we are called to hate our sinful past. Don't run back to it. Have a distaste for how you once lived. Have compassion and love for sinners who have not yet come to Christ. Have compassion for them. Preach the gospel boldly for them, regardless of, the, regardless of the cost to yourself. Share the gospel with them. Die to yourself for them. But in regards to your old manner of living, don't entertain that as if it's something to keep kind of hidden on the side. If you hate sin, you will hate your former manner of living when you were enslaved to it, when you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Look at what Peter says in verse 3. He says, For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles. Having pursued a course, and then he goes into a list of things that particularly these early believers he knew were characterized by. I love how Peter states this. It's almost in, in jest. The time has already passed. It's sufficient. Your sin prior to knowing Christ has already done enough damage. It's run its course. Don't, don't let it loose. You've caged the beast. Don't unleash it again. It's caused enough destruction. He's saying you spend enough time in your past living like the world, doing what the world does. Don't live that way anymore. Your old life has brought about enough destruction. Think about that as you pursue holiness. My old manner of life, these old sins, they've done enough destruction. I don't want them in my life anymore. You spend enough of your life willfully sinning against God. Don't run back to that kind of living, thinking that you will gain something you now lack in Christ. That's the temptation we face, though, when running back to those old sins. Something in Christ is not enough. I'm not satisfied enough. I'm not content enough. I don't believe that this is the right path. There's something else that will gratify me that my life is missing. And so you run back to those old sins, that old thinking, that old manner of life. And Peter says, don't do it. Don't think that running back to that old way of life will bring some sort of reprieve to the difficulty of suffering for Christ. Have you ever felt that? You're in, you're in the heat of affliction. Life is hard. The trials are real. And you think, if I could just go back to this old thing that was so comforting in moments like this. It's interesting what Peter draws attention to. It's primarily sensuality and drunkenness. And I'm sure there's many other sins that we are prone to run back to and tempted to go pursue. Those are the primary ones that he puts here. It's helpful for us to think about these things. He says the desire of the Gentiles. This is simply a way of saying the longings of pagans. The old life, it was destructive enough. You've seen the emptiness of your old life. It's done enough damage. Have you felt that way about sin before? Maybe it's your sin. Maybe it's somebody else's sin close to you. 
and you're just brokenhearted at the destruction that is left in the wake of sin, it's devastating, heartbreaking. There is no redeeming quality found in sin. It's just destructive. And then Peter gives this list of six sins that characterized the early readers and undoubtedly characterized us in various ways. And this isn't a comprehensive list of what the desire of the Gentiles is, but Peter's putting forth this list as a summary of all sorts of evils, and he actually puts them in the plural. Each of these is in the plural which indicates really the variety and the frequency of all of these various sins. What does that mean? That means each of these categories is put in the category of being multiple of these things. So it's, you're uh, characterized by lying. You were a liar, not you lied once. So they're in the plural. And then he says this list. He starts with sensuality. This is a lack of personal restraint as you involve yourself in all sorts of shameless deeds. Moral impurity is clearly involved in this, but it's rooted out of a heart that is seeking to indulge fleshly appetites without any shame or any restraint. Now, some of you came to Christ when you were very young and you did not have opportunity to act out all of these sins in your fleshly, unregenerate state. Some of you came to Christ later in life. And you probably can think back and remember when fleshly indulgence, sensuality ruled your heart. Fleshly appetites without any shame or restraint. Maybe you found yourself boasting in these things. And then he says, lusts. These are the depraved cravings, strong passions, inner desires of the fallen man. This is particularly the strong desires or strong passions for that which is carnal, temporal, fleshly. And then he sees, we see next drunkenness. This word gives the picture of one who is overflowing with wine. That is habitual drinking. Habitual drunkenness. A, a continual preoccupation with alcohol. Was that you? Couldn't wait to get home because you couldn't wait to get buzzed because you couldn't wait to get intoxicated. making decisions about what your plans were for the weekend based off of the opportunity to get drunk. Next, he says carousing. This refers to a festive gathering, particularly ones that honor various gods, and this was typically a party or a festive gathering to honor, I think he pronounced it Bacchus. It's the god of wine and fertility where there was really no restraints on the indulgences and in evil that would be carried out. It was both sensual and characterized by drunkenness, excessive drunkenness. And in complement to these were drinking parties. This would include festive gatherings that were essentially an excess, or an excuse rather, to drink in excess. What can we throw a party for so that we can get drunk? And then Peter says, an abominable idolatries. This would have been the evil worship of idols and all of the wickedness that would accompany this false worship, which would typically include sinful uses of alcohol and gross immorality. And Peter says, the destruction of all of these things has already run its course in your life prior to Christ. Do not run back to these old, old pet sins, these old Manners of living. Don't run back to the destruction that it causes because it's already run its course. Enough evil has been done. And listen, these are the ones that Peter puts before us. What are yours? In the midst of hardship, trial, persecution, what are you tempted to run back to? Thinking that it will provide some sort of comfort or relief. 
Don't do it. Don't do it. Be done with those things. We must also prepare our hearts to understand that with this will come the rejection of your former companions. The rejection of your former companions. The proper motivation to possess. We are to hate our sinful former manner of living and the destruction that it causes. We must also understand that with that will come a rejection of your former companions, those you used to run towards sin with as well as others. Look at verse 4. Peter says, in all this, they're surprised. What is the, in all this, in all of your refraining from running back to those old things that characterized you because you have disdain for that former way of life and you now are pursuing holiness for the glory of God in Christ Jesus. In all of that, they, these former companions, are surprised that you don't run with them into the same excesses of dissipation and they malign you. Those you used to associate with, the world, those who do not know Christ, people who are consumed with your former way of life, they'll reject you when you no longer embrace that former way of life. And all of this, that is, in your refraining from living the destructive lifestyle you once walked in, your personal life of association with Christ in pursuit of holiness, they're surprised by that. Those of the world will be provoked by your new life. Your former sin mates are surprised you don't run with them like you used to. They're stunned, they're shocked, but it is with a resentment sort of shock. They actually take offense to this new manner of living. Why? Because even if you say nothing about them needing to stop, your pursuit of holiness is an indictment on them. You're living out the light of Christ in front of them, and the world hates the light and loves the darkness. I remember years ago when I was doing training for a bank that I worked at. We trained downtown, and there was a group who was in the training sessions, and at lunch they would want to go to a restaurant that really kind of capitalized on sensuality and... The whole group would want to go there, and I, I just refrained. I'm not, I'm not going to that restaurant. And so I packed my lunch, and I ate alone, and I got made fun of frequently. It was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. Better to suffer for righteousness. Remember, Peter's already put that in front of us. The temptation is there to want to give in, and Peter's saying, no, don't do it. Don't go back to that old way of life. Don't go back to that old manner of living. Why is this new life so shocking? Why is it so offensive? Because they are running after sinful things where you used to do that with them. You used to participate in those things. You used to indulge in those things, but now you are completely the opposite and it angers them because your life is an indictment upon them. Peter says they're surprised because you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. Excesses, this is also the, the word that could be used for floods or abundance. And then he uses the word dissipation, and I love his word choice here. Peter uses the word dissipation. It it's actually has the root of the word to save, but he adds the negative to the front of it. So it's this idea of taking the, the, the word save and combining it with the negative. So it's, it's the unsaving things. What are unsaving things? It's things that don't preserve your life. Things that wreak havoc on your life. It's, it's things that destroy you and others. They are running into a non-preserving way of life and they're shocked that you don't join in and so they malign you, they blaspheme you, they slander you. It'd be like this. Hey, everybody, we're running off a cliff. And you say, I used to run off cliffs. I'm no longer going to run off that cliff with you. And as they're running off the cliff, they are slandering you, they are maligning you, they are insulting you. And they're shocked and yet they are running to their own destruction. Peter is so helpful here to set the expectations. When you are 
in Christ, you forsake your old way of life, and you will suffer for it in this life. You will face persecution. And the temptation might be to compromise, to soften your stance on holiness, to pull back from the new life you have in Christ. And Peter's saying, don't let your heart go there. Don't run back to these damaging sins. They've already run their course in your life. Don't go back to that. And and understand that as your life is transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ, the hostility will only increase. You'll only garner the ridicule of the world. Your former companions in sin will be shocked You no longer want to join with them, and they will malign you. That's the expectation he's setting here. Although, do you remember what else he said already earlier? Look back at chapter 2. Verse 12. In fact, look at verse 11 first. Beloved, This is chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. You will be maligned for Christ. You will be slandered for your faithfulness to him, and, and the Lord just might use your faithfulness to bring others to Christ. Could you imagine? Have you experienced that yet? Have you had the privilege of sitting with someone who used to run in accordance to their flesh only all the time and have them ask you, how do I get what you have? And walk them through that. It is like nothing you could possibly imagine. And any suffering that you ever have to endure for Christ is worth it. To get to have that conversation with someone. To see God do that work in someone's life. We're not promised that that is the inevitable outcome for all. But it is for some. And so what's our obligation here? Hold fast. Don't run back to the old manner of life. Be faithful. Pursue godliness. Even in the midst of the affliction. Even in the midst of the ridicule. Your former companions in sin, they will be shocked that you no longer want to join with them. And they'll malign you. Have you experienced that? I'm sure some of you have. Old friends you haven't seen for years, you meet up with them. You're a totally different person than you were at one point in time. Hey, let's go do fill in the blank, all the sins that you used to do in love. Let's talk about all the sinful things you used to love to talk about. And I'm not really into that anymore. Let me tell you why. And then they mock you. They malign you. Be ready. Be ready for that in your heart. Don't compromise. Don't soften your stance on the truth of the gospel and the precious reality of who Jesus is as your Lord and Savior. Remember that sin is destructive. It has already run its course in your life. Don't put the shackles back on and run back into that life that is so damaging and destructive. You may feel your life is being threatened by those around you, your reputation, could be at stake, but there is something far more destructive, a far more destructive threat than any of the things that somebody might do against you or say about you, and the far more destructive threat is you running back to your old sin. Don't go there. Persevere. Press on in holiness. You've been reconciled to God in Christ. You don't follow those things anymore, and even though your old life is, is stunned and highly offended those in your life, keep pressing on in faithfulness. And in the midst of that, you can take comfort knowing 
that God is the good judge. He sees it all. He hears it all. There's no conversation that is had that he is unaware of. There is no slanderous statement made that goes unnoticed by God. There's no maligning of your personal character that you must avenge. Have you ever felt that way? You hear yourself slandered and you think, I've got to write this. They need to understand the truth. I felt that inside where I needed to vindicate myself. And Peter's actually going to point us to the reality that there will be ultimate vindication and it will not come through you or through me, but it will become through the righteous, holy judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge all. Those who have died and those who are living will face judgment before the Lord God Almighty and they will give an account. And so don't bother yourself with those things. You press on in holiness. And then he's going to help us in verse 7 and on know how to really get after it. Well, our time is done for this evening, and we have not covered verses 5 and 6, so we are going to have a part 3 next week. I think there was some <laughs> prophetic utterances at uh, summer camp by Ezra, who, imitating me in one of their skits, talked about First Peter 3, 1 through 3, part 27. He was spot on. <laughs> And I think it's one of those, sorry, not sorry, this is good. We need to spend some time lingering in verse 5 and 6. And this is helpful for us, is it not? Because listen, this life is hard. We face these things, and it's only going to increase, and we need to press on in holiness. Well, let's pray, and then we will sing together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how instructive it is for us, how helpful it is for us. And Lord, we pray that as we have been exposed to your truth this evening, that these truths would take root deep in our hearts and side of us, Lord, that we would be shaped and fashioned by them through your spirit, that we would be more useful for your purposes in this world. Help us to not run back to our former manner of living but help us to persevere with all steadfastness and diligence and godliness. Help us to believe that it is better to live with the mindset of Christ for the will of God than for any temporal convenience or pleasure or comfort. And the reality is, is that when we live this way, there is far greater comfort, far greater pleasure joy and peace indescribable. So Lord, help us to believe these things. Help us to live in light of these things. And Lord, we pray that you would use us walking by your spirit, living in the strength and the power that you provide to be a gospel witness in this community to our family and our friends and neighbors and co-workers in this community so that many would come to know the riches of your mercy and grace as we have. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.